Bricks and Minifigs is your one-stop shop for all things LEGO. Hit the link below to find a store near you. Hey everyone, Joshua Hanlon here, and today we have returned to Jang Bricks and to check out his incredible LEGO City layout. Our last update on this was all the way back in 2019, actually when Boone Langston was here covering the city, and a lot has changed since then, not least of which is Boone becoming a LEGO designer and moving to Billin to design sets. And of course, you have continued to update this city as well, so that's what we're here to check out. So we'll kind of start in this general section here and make our way around. Uh, but before we do that, what's kind of the overview of the city here and what are some of the big changes that you made? Some of which people might notice with where we're standing right now. The biggest right change is the fact that we are right here, like <laughs> literally in this spot. There was a table right here in the middle before. I've just kind of had a mental, a mental change to really focus on the viewing experience as opposed to the specifics of exactly how much space that I'm using up and you know how many buildings can I fit into this table right here and so it's just it just has a more more open flow and layout to to be able to to walk around it so it's it's required taking some of the the tables out uh which has been a sacrifice but I think it I think it's nice to be able to just <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just, it's just free range of motion. Yeah, yeah, and being able to, to you know, get over to the to the train station here and look inside mm -hmm. of the train and things like that. So basically, the overall the overall concept is this is kind of more uh, the the urban area. So this is the the downtown area. Eventually, I'm going to have a little bit of residential area off towards the the shoreline here. But you know, it's kind of like your your office spaces and things like that here. And then the other side is a little bit farther away from from the city, you know, so in some industrial stuff, lots of the, the train stuff, more industrial off to the to the corner, and just a huge zoo in the middle, because zoo and animals. Are just, fantastic. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> No, I love that change, though, because you put, obviously, an incredible amount of time and effort into creating this stuff. And by opening it up, you just are able to appreciate that so much more and really, like you said, get close to the details and things versus before when it was like, you know, a lot of the stuff that you had poured a lot of effort into and you could, ba you could barely see it. Yeah, yeah. And, th and that goes for, for myself as well as, as, well as viewers because, you know, I, I, I've realized that I need to really enjoy this stuff as well as, you know, the, the amount of time that goes into it to getting like the scenes, you know, little interactions between minifigures and things. And three, the main reason that I do that and the main reason that I have the most love within Leg within the Lego hobby for doing the custom stuff is just, it just ties back to my childhood looking at those, those little miniature catalogs <laughs> that came with the, the sets from the 80s, uh, visiting the... Uh, Oakland Nat Natural History Museum, and they'd have you know scenes that were I mean, kind of frozen in time, kind of stuff, and that that just it just brings pure joy to me, you know. And so, for myself to be able to every once in a while, every once in a while, just stop for a couple seconds, you know, stop the content <laughs> creation, and just and just look, mm -hmm. you know, and just be like, oh, that's cool, you know, <laughs> get down to it, and then knowing that. When I film those same areas, I'm able to to share that out. You know, I'm able to to multiply that and and let other people have that same that same kind of feeling. That's that's really what it's all about. Yeah. yeah. No, I love that so much. That is fantastic. Well, we can dive into the details a little more here. Mm -hmm. So, if we want to kind of take us through this section here, it looks okay. like it's kind of the the water section coming yeah. up through the beach. Yeah. So th this this. The, the water used to extend all the way across and I've just reduced it down. This is actually inspired, I kind of grew up around around boats, so a lot of what you see here is inspired by different private marinas and, and little spaces around the, around the bay. Everything on this layout that you're gonna see on top of the tables today is now custom. So I've I've gotten rid of anything that is based on based on a on a set. So that's a super important point there. I want to emphasize that. That's okay. amazing because uh, you know in, in the past it wasn't always that way, yeah. and so it's changed yeah. up now where it's a hundred percent custom yeah. on the layout. Yeah, we're gonna see we're gonna see that with some empty spaces where a lot of modulars used used to be, but for for just right here, this is this is probably one of the one of the few areas that I consider to be finished finished level of of detail. So it's just a, a small private style of, of marina with a little bit of shore. The, the pink is inspired, the pink flowers are inspired by ice plants that grow along shores of some local marinas as well. I just wanted to have that, that color in there. Cool. The boat is inspired by a boat that I actually sailed on back in the early 90s out, out <laughs> on the bay. We've changed the, the rigging a little bit, but uh, yeah, just 
again, just capturing some, some moments. Not exactly, you know, nothing is, nothing is really intended to be a, a replica. Is th this isn't you here? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's me uh, uh, next year. Give probably. it some time, a <laughs> few more. <laughs> I'm almost there, almost there. Get, the bald spot has to kind of migrate forward, you know, <laughs> a, little, a little bit on that. And the idea with the, the edge here is any, anywhere you get to an edge of a table and either train track or uh, road continues on, it's literally sliced through the world. So this isn't my entire world. This is just a little bit of it that would fit into the room and, and just mentally the idea is that it continues in, in every direction. Sometimes not necessarily completely proportional. So like, you know, there might be a big, where we're standing right now, right now might be miles and miles of space before we get to the, before we get to the, next, the next table. Yeah, there and you then, go. And then you also have from this side the ability to look down and look through the water. Again, proportions, not necessarily, like this is the deep sea, we were just by the shore, but that's okay, right? Uh, this space has gotten a bunch more color, a bunch more color, because when I think about, when I think about undersea and just video and pictures of undersea, I just, the color, you know, like coral reefs and stuff, that is, that is, that is what I want to see. That's just one of the most beautiful things in the world. So I spent some time just making more color, just <laughs> Clumps of coral and, and coming up with different part combinations to, to represent. Not any specific, you know, species or anything, just that. That, that vibrant yeah, feel and yeah. imagination. Yeah, no, and it's yeah. so true. Yeah. Uh, I think anyone who's ever kind of spent time snorkeling or diving, that type of thing, in any lots of different spots around the world where you can enjoy that incredible marine life. And so you capture a lot of that here. I like the way you've even added kind of the schools of fish hanging down there. Yeah, yeah. I want to I experiment with that a little bit more. You know, getting it, getting it to to look more like you're you're in in the water and not mm -hmm. not just looking through a void to you know down to the to the sea floor. Since this is below the table, this is like I said, everything above the table is is allowed is is custom only. But down here, I, I'm still allowing myself obviously to include some things that are that are not uh, custom. So like the the submarines and obviously the Pirates of the Caribbean sunken sunken ship. Mostly, mostly unmodified. Then all the, the flora and fauna. I try to mix, mix and up a little bit. The interesting thing here is you've used like the old space moon base plates there yeah. as the base, so it creates kind of that ocean floor effect, even though it's obviously from the space theme. Yeah, yeah. I just, yeah. On, honestly, I had I had a big classic space uh, layout. I had every classic space set together from from the original era when they all, all had one color for the for the torsos and I, I donated those those sets to charity but had a whole bunch of extra uh, uh, the lunar plates mm -hmm. and they had to be used somewhere they had to be and this just felt like a like a perfect combination it even gives me with the the craters the pock marks kind of give me some space to to put you know little coral formations and things yeah it just adds a lot of a lot of texture to it. Fantastic. And we'll move back up here to the beach area. And I love mm -hmm. these little details here. You've got uh, the seagull attack happening. It's, yep, that, that used to be Yoda there from the, <laughs> from the bad lip reading, famous, uh, famous video. But now those are actually a couple of real people. Those are, those are uh, Patreon members who've been uh, substituted in there. And ar around, the, around the place, I finally have updated the uh, Patreon figures. So. You know, these, some of these minifigures that you're going to see are actual real, real people. That, that's really cool. And, that, and that's a good time to mention kind of the way that your content has progressed over the years. One of the things with that is you're, of course, on Patreon uh, where everyone should go support Jang over there if you're not already. We'll have a link in the description. Fantastic <laughs> stuff. <laughs> and, of course, you're on the platform, but you also have great perks there for people. So one of them is that they can be included in the layout, right? Yes, yes. There you go. <laughs> That's perfect. I, <laughs> you didn't tell me you were going to be promoting stuff. <laughs> oh, I'll always be promoting, Jay, of course. <laughs> I appreciate it. I appreciate it. I appreciate you guys being supporters since day one. For sure. As, as well, during, during some tough times, but we've really formed a nice, a nice tight-knit community over there that I really, really appreciate. And a lot of moral support, especially, is you know, getting to, to know, know folks a little bit more closely. Um, and not just as viewers out there, you know, in, mm -hmm. in, in the mass of YouTube and, and putting even plastic faces to names. <laughs> right, you know, right. It's, it's, 
it's it's good. It's it's wholesome. So we'll we'll see more of that then yeah. as well. But for now, we'll keep moving on to this fantastic building. So what does this represent here? This is like a like an upscale condo unit. It's my first custom decent sized residential unit. So it's fully lit up. I used um, a lighting system from uh, from Brick Stuff. Okay. Uh, Brickstuff.com. They're they were kind of the the originator for the current standard, worldwide standard that a lot of people have copied since uh, uh, for really, really small connectors that you can fit through, hollow studs and everything is really, really convenient. One of the first places that I've actually lit up, you know, because I eventually I would like everything on the layout to be lit up from the, from the inside. And this was just, just using their, uh, their, their products. Not sponsored. No sponsored. <laughs> Not sponsored. <laughs> But this they look the, fantastic, and I love how you've got the, the every, detail inside yeah, there. Yeah, every, apar every apartment or, or condo is actually detailed on, on both sides. You can't really see all of it, but, you know, you take the, the floors apart, and if you're looking through any of the windows, you can just just see that I've really thought about this person's life, you know, or these people's <laughs> lives. So what, what, what are they into? What are they interested in? What are they doing right now? And this isn't inspired by any particular building uh, at all. This one is just completely... Okay, what colors do I have a bunch of, and have I not used, you know, up to this point, yeah. and just come coming up with some weird shapes from the other side? It looks maybe a little bit more interesting, but like the the overhang here with the carport underneath is just it's just weird, you know. <laughs> and I, I like to just push myself. I traditionally with design work, I, I come from a visual design and graphic design background in in my previous career. I've had a problem of of being like on grid. You know, doing things to 90 degree angles mm -hmm. and having trouble doing a whole lot of color, you know, just bringing in brave colors and stuff. So I try to really push myself with with the stuff that I that I build out here because there's nothing to lose, you know, and, <laughs> and hey. Right. Nobody's standing here critiquing you. Uh, in the, maybe in the comments section, but not 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 in the city. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I love the, the great thing about this style of a building is there is kind of a lot of different directions you can take it in. And yeah. like you said, it's just kind of generally inspired. So yeah. there's so much cool stuff you can do. Do you build it kind of modular where it's easy to take off like, yeah. parts yeah. and everything? Yeah, all, and then... all my buildings, definite, definitely the, the the roof pops up. Okay. Know, it's not always the the most convenient thing, but, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of take the the system that Lego uses for modulars with the the tiles and then, you know, minimal number, number of studs mm -hmm. or other things to, to locate the individual uh, floors. That right there is the most recent building that I actually put into the city. Um, that one was almost entirely built live. One of my first buildings that I've, that I've done completely live. Up top is a is like a, a dance club, an outdoor yeah. dance club. In the middle is a is a bar. So it's like a like a swanky posh kind of bar. You can just see through the window. You can just see the uh, the bottle wall there. And then the lower floor is a deli. So the idea is that, you know, it's just a place for folks to, to hang out during the day and then also in the evening after, after work because this is, this is the downtown area. I've got my, my one lone skyscraper that's, that's actually, actually built. Uh, I did that, gosh, too many years ago. Just, uh, I knew that I wanted the skyline to be tall over on the side. You know, for downtown area, I wanted big office buildings. And this is unfortunately empty right now and it's it's very you know very very simple but it's big and it you know it gets gets things started and i got the suggestion of another skyscraper that's going to be built at, at some point you know using i think using uh construction equipment is a good way to kind of fake in that yeah I, I mean for this to be empty right now you know it's, oh it's, yeah it's this realistic. is planned <laughs> yes exactly but eventually i'll have at least two more skyscrapers in this space, possibly three of some, some different sizes. So I need to figure out the, the colors and the shapes because with the, the first one that I did, obviously I went for almost maximum height that would fit into the space and then, you know, really leaned in heavily on one color and then having that triangular, that right triangle uh, cross section to it. So as you look at it from different angles, it, it kind of has an optical illusion. Yeah. You know, from, from one side it looks super skinny and then from this edge here, it, it looks wide. So I'll, I'll try to do different things, you know, play with the eyes and play with perception a little bit uh, differently with the other ones. But uh, also as part of, part of my, my shift in, in mentality for approaching the, the city, I've opened things up. And even my ultimate plan is to still have more things open where you can just see like the, the plaza area this is not gonna be filled up 
with a whole bunch of buildings. You know, there's a small building here, which is like a tech shop. That's actually inspired by uh, the old Sharper Image uh, uh, building in downtown San Francisco. I don't, even, I don't think it exists. I think it turned into an, into an Apple store. The, the building was kept. I think it turned into an Apple store. I don't even know if it's still there now, but you know, just a, a little place that you might expect to see in a, in a San Francisco type of, of, of area. You know, you get your, your phones and whatever, yeah. whatever tech that these Lego people have in, in their, their near future fantasy world. I love the architectural elements and some oh, of the pieces you. you use there that aren't your typical kind of city building type elements. Yeah, some, some bionicle right. stuff. and. Uh, the big support pieces that are actually used, like the big A-frame pieces that are used typically for uh, supports for cranes. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, yeah, I just wanted to, to get wild. You know, <laughs> just do <laughs> no, something. Binoculars something as the door handles around the front here yeah. as well. So. Just, yeah, double, double <laughs> handles. I think, I don't know, there's some of, the, some of the minifigures, some of the minifigures around there look kind of familiar. Huh, too. yeah. It looks like maybe there's some news coverage happening of the store there. Huh. Well, I mean, that, make, that makes sense. I can understand. I don't know who those guys are, but it makes sense that you know, they would want to check it out. You know, a little, little interesting architectural background, at, at least. You know, they appear to be the, very professional the... and doing a good job. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> but no, no, other, no other big buildings in this space. So it'll just be an area where you, know, you can see minifigures having, having interactions and stuff. One thing we did not mention in this area yet is kind of the, the station area here. Oh, yeah. And obviously we'll get to a lot more trains later on. Yeah. I know trains are really, really a really big thing for you. Yes. And uh, that's kind of what the impetus for a lot of this is mm -hmm. the train layout. Mm -hmm. So uh, what can you tell us about this station? Uh, it's inspired by McDonald's. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> this, is a, this is an elevated rail. I've got just a, just a loop. It's a four wide loop. Lego has done a, a limited number of the, the four stud wide uh, train tracks with turns. It was before they switched to the the uh, roller coaster yeah. track system. So they've got some turns. I think they first did it for Indiana Jones uh, for the for the ball roll. I think uh, in the in the mine or wait or both of those actually they did both of those. But I used their turns, customized them just a little bit, and then if you look across to the other side, that's a, a, a power functions powered four stud wide, fully fully self uh, you know self propelled mm -hmm. battery operated little little light rail that basically is a is a substitute for monorail you know cuz if you do if you do monorail you can add a lot of with the classic stuff you can do you can add a lot of things onto the base but ultimately you're fundamentally sticking with what lego gave you you know there aren't that that many options and i just you know again this was before the the uh, the roller coaster pieces that a lot of people use now right. for, for light rail. And so I've just got a small loop and then one of the, the yellow station is just a, a small stop, um, just a regular inner, inner city, in, yeah, intra city, I guess, uh, stop. And then the other one is a connector between the elevator rail and the main rail, you know, the, the big main rail that, that also goes around and separately and is, is connected between the, the different areas. But those, uh, so the, the yellow one hasn't moved, the gray one has, has moved quite a bit with the, with the recent changes. But I think it fits in pretty well. I think it kind of makes sense to have it, um, you know, connecting just kind of to the other side of, of the city. Again, think about proportions not being mm -hmm. correct here, you know, <laughs> so that's farther, farther across the, you know, across town. Use your imagination. Yeah, that works. Yeah. So we'll definitely get some more trains later on for sure, yeah, but you've got yeah, a couple yeah. of other buildings here. So yeah. what do these represent here? Yep. This one, uh, let's, let's bring you around a little bit, a little bit more from this side. So one, one side just has a, has a billboard on it. But this one has, um, on the, on the right-hand side is, or kind of towards the back, is a bike shop. And I, I just really like Lego's classic motorcycles. And a, f a couple of the old bike-related uh, sets that they've made, and I wanted to use some of those stickers and some of those parts. And the building itself is inspired by a, a place that I that I worked in San Francisco, but the stuff that's in it is completely different. So it's just it's just like a co a, a collection of of Lego motorcycle pieces and uh, and stickers, and then the other side is. Uh, ice cream shop down on the bottom, and the upper part is a video game arcade, which 
we don't have that much of in the real world anymore. <laughs> but back in the day, you know, the times when I was inspired by by like by those little Lego catalogs, you know, another thing I was inspired by was video game arcade. Yeah. So I brought one in here. And then across the street from that is the uh, police station. Finally, I I trashed my old uh, police station because it was that, that was actually I think one of my very first custom builds was the. Uh, on the old layout at the old house even. And I, tr I completely took that apart, used as many of its pieces as possible here, but then made something much, much larger. This is completely detailed on the inside. Uh, the The architecture here is actually interesting in in it, uh, a physical design way because it looks like this is structure here, but it's actually just an insert for, for, for looks. So this doesn't support it at all. This is actually cantilevered out. All of this weight is supported by the other side and the the individual floors will still lift up and are, are separatable. There are actually two floors kind of hidden over on the left hand side as well. But I've got like everything that I could think of from a that you would expect to see in a in a TV police station, you know, like <laughs> in, a, in a CI NCIS or you know CSI kind of kind of kind of show, including a uh, uh, a CSI lab that's. 100% inspired by a TV show. It's like they've got <laughs> they've got the, the the quirky tech in there and oh yeah some of the, some of the stuff that you'll see. It, I don't have it lit up right now, but eventually that'll that'll get fully lit up as well. But yeah, a lot of details you know don't get aren't able to be appreciated from the outside. But that's why I, I, I do the, the offline videos. You know, looking looking through the interiors, and uh, yeah, again once once I get it lit up, it'll it'll help. Up a lot. I love the architectural detail that you were talking about there with that section that just kind of looks nice, isn't necessarily for structural <laughs> a structural use, but it, it just adds something unique to the whole building. And it was totally an accident because I was I was just looking at how that got there was I was looking at how to set up windows, if there was any way that I could set up windows for the next level when I was working on the first floor for the next level, uh, getting something that just would be different, mm -hmm. you know, so I would just put, I just put a bunch of window frame pieces together, had it sitting there, and then I just thought, I'm just gonna leave that. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't planned at all, but it just it just it just kind of worked for me. And rather than having it another rectangular void space, I thought, yeah, what the heck. <laughs> And kind of just moving outside that section, yeah. we see another fantastic example of both interior details and the lighting that we talked about earlier. So that the lighting really does add uh, so much here. That's yeah. something that I love to see you've added. Even the little subtle lighting underneath the track that we were just looking at, mm -hmm. all of those little things kind of make it stand out so much. I can't wait to, to have every single building lit up. Because yeah, like the Enterprise Medical Center over here, uh, you've seen that before, but it's it's still a type of place where because you can see in it, you can kind of get lost in it, you know, and, and I can come back after, you know, not looking at the details for a while and I can still be discovering <laughs> things that I completely forgot were in there. I intentionally designed this with as many windows as possible so that you wouldn't have to take it apart to, to see the inside. And again, you know, lots of individual scenes. I always think about what is this minifigure doing and why are they there, you know, what, what, what are they headed towards? What are they going to be doing? What have they done before this moment in time that we're seeing right now? Um, yeah. That's so cool. You're kind of creating a whole story for yeah. almost everyone kind of yes. in, in the city kind of has their a fleshed out personality in a sense. Yeah. And I don't, I don't think, I, I think a lot of that doesn't really come through on video, but it's just, again, the, the, the core of, what I love in, in Lego is being able to get lost in it and the, you know, being able to use your imagination and kind of fill in some of the stuff or derive from, from the scenes these stories, you know, and yeah. yeah it really, really takes you back to, I think a lot of people can identify that with, you know, being a kid and just kind of yeah. using their imagination to spread yeah. out. I know I did that a lot. Yeah. When, when I was young, you just kind of spreading out whatever sets and pieces you had and creating a a whole world, and mm -hmm. yeah, you gave everybody a backstory, and everybody's got mm -hmm. something they're they're working on. Or doing. A mission. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's so neat. And then on top here, this helicopter is great as well. So Lego has done kind of various, re uh, whether it's like a hospital or rescue helicopter, mm -hmm. that type of thing. But this this looks fantastic. Oh, here. Thank you. It's 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 a little dated by now, probably with more more modern pieces and smaller uh, bracket pieces, especially smaller snot. Uh, 
components, you know, could have made it more smooth and everything, but, you know, at least it does, it opens up and, you know, it's accessible from, from the side and, and from, from the back and fits a, somebody in the pilot's seat and, you know, kind of does its, its job, fits a person in there with an attendant uh, to be transported and, yeah. And I think this one's, I think, inspired by the Eurocopter a little bit, a little bit. A little bit. <laughs> this one actually has a working elevator. I remember when uh, Boone was here, he was really interested in the in the elevator itself. It's it's set up with uh, with power functions. It's another thing where it's this one's not lit up from the inside because you know, it moves. So managing the wires is it's kind of its own thing. But right. Yeah. The uh, the it's got a winch from the top, and you know it'll hold like a couple of figures plus a stretcher inside as well, and be able to hit all the floors. You have to manually operate the doors, but it's in there. It was, it was kind of a thing where I just wanted to challenge myself to, to see if I could do it, you know, in a, in a reasonable amount of space and make it actually, actually work. It's crazy how much detail you packed in there. <laughs> thank you, thank you. And then this next building here, uh, I think, uh, has this one been on the layout for a little while, this or one, when did that one it, come around? It has, but this whole, this whole space here has just recently changed. And okay. Obviously, there's a, there's a bunch of open, empty space there, but that, that building has a has a laser tag arena on top. I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna do this right now because it's a shame to, to almost never see the interior of this, but like just, just to give you an idea of what you're missing most of the time. Whoa, <laughs> look at that. And it's the classic like black light look yep, in there. Yep. Yes, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, uh, the entrance to that is on the lower floor and it's just a little, you know, your, your typical, uh, reception space you know buy your tickets buy your time and see what the you know what the schedule is and then you've got your equipment room and you've got a game being played with the with the two teams it's classic rvb you know red versus blue <laughs> and yeah you got the got the ready room a little control room and the the major base areas in, in the corners you know to to try to attack if you're playing that kind of as opposed to free for all mm -hmm. you, know, you play the mission style ones and stuff so this is another space that I want to get lights in eventually, but specifically because of 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 the style with all the all the black and the idea that it's very dark in there except for some you know a lot of UV lights of course the windows are all blacked out so this is one yeah so this is one space where if if I lit it up you still wouldn't see anything on the inside oh, okay. except for just right here there's a, <laughs> there's a little bit of preview spot but other other than that everything is is blacked out just. Uh, I, I, it didn't make sense to me when I was when I was doing it. It would have been better for us to be able to see it from the outside, but when I was doing it, I just thought, no, this, there's not windows in a laser tag arena. So. No, you got to keep it realistic. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes. What what it, what is that balance like for you? Thinking about kind of that broader idea of the realism versus just kind of fun creativity and making it look cool. Do you keep that in mind with a lot of these buildings? I am honestly all over the place. Okay. With that. I I sometimes. When I'm when I'm building a particular vehicle or something, I want it to look like it would be feasible, you know, proportion-wise to work with the minifigs with their big old blocky heads and everything. But you know, I want it to I want it to be feasible. And other times, I just kind of mentally slap myself in the face, just think, "This is a Lego, dude. You know, <laughs> don't take it seriously. It'll be better if you don't take it seriously." So I, I just I kind of play with that. I go back and back and forth. I don't have any single set rule for for how to approach that. And then what John is starting to show now, I think it's kind of your mall building mm -hmm. there, right? The classic, the classic mall. I've not updated the visitor counter in many, <laughs> many years. I was gonna say, so this is one of those buildings that I think has been on, like videos on your channel and has been on the layout for a, a long time. I think, was it 2014, 2015-ish? I think okay. when, I, when I completed it in its original form. And it's not changed too much since, since the original unveiling of it. Uh, lighting, I think, has been updated. Yeah, I think it didn't have full lighting originally. Yeah, it didn't. It didn't have full lighting. So this one, this one also has the the brick stuff system used for lighting exclusively, including uh, connectors between the floors. So this one is able to open up as well, but it it's uh, wireless between them. It just uses direct contact. So as soon as you pick a floor up, then the up, that upper floor loses power. Oh, you know, I see. Just contact yeah. uh, at connectors. But every single uh, shop in there is fully detailed. <laughs> There's a Lego store downstairs with a kid outside who's having a fit because he didn't get the the set that he wanted and his parents are just uh, <laughs> you know, 
little elevator inside and the plaza outside is something that that's a little bit a little bit new so off, over to the left where this blank upside down ba base place pla base plate is there's going to be more stores in this area so it's going to have a uh, kind of a, a u uh, inverted u shape to the pedestrian accessible area so it becomes more of more of a destination, like a shopping destination, including some off-street parking brought in from the side, as opposed to previously, I always tried to have uh, roads going everywhere. Uh, previously, there was just not a lot of minifig accessible space. So opening that up to more stories and more scenes of minifigs, you know, actually living in the space and, you know, traveling from one area to the other, doing chores and things, also at the same time, again, gives us more ability to look into it. You know, we, we see it more open than it's gonna be right now, but having a large lane where we'll be able to stand here and just kind of look, look straight through, you know, I think, I think is, 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 is just another thing that's gonna help this to be a more enjoyable space to, to enjoy as a viewer. And also, again, uh, again for just myself. You know, right. <laughs> How often do you come down to these buildings that you have these detailed interiors in? Do you spend time uh, you know, updating stuff in there or kind of once all that interior is done, is that pretty much set and you're, you're not kind of messing around with that too much? Because, because there's so much to do yet, I try to, I try to get something fairly done and then move on to a completely mm -hmm. different project. But I'm not against, uh, if, if I get the inspiration and I just want to change things in a, in a space, I'll just do it. You know, I try, I try not to limit myself too, too much in where my inspiration will, will take me. Now, up to this point, we've seen a lot of great kind of architecture and city building, but we come to this section now, which is fantastic landscaping here. And that's something I love to see at, you know, builds we cover at conventions is just really good kind of natural work like trees. And then obviously the rock work is a big part of a lot of people's builds as well. So this is, this is really great here. And this is part of the, the train tunnel, correct? Yeah, yeah. So a couple, a couple train loops get connected through here, but thank you. It's, it's not fully... Um... It's like the edges out here, we can see a lot of corner burps and things that are still um, uh, visible a little bit. It needs it needs you know some more smoothing, but most of it, most of the bulk of it, I'm I'm fairly happy with them. Uh, I I <laughs> the way that I approach this is is weird. I didn't approach it from a Lego perspective. I approached it from a geological perspective and thought of okay, how do different strata form? And what would you know? What would different mineral layers look like, and how would they erode over time? <laughs> and also, what type of plants would would live in a particular area, like in a in a, a micro uh, microbiome mm -hmm. kind of kind of space? So uh, you've got the the dark tan. Just I had a lot of dark tan burps, and I wanted to use them. I wanted to bring in color. I didn't want to do just an just another gray. Uh, bump on the layout. I already have one of those. So I brought those in and I also have some of the older old gray uh, burps and just kind of use that as a as a transition between the different mineral layers and you know probably the the dark tan represents more of a sandstone kind of kind of thing and thinking about how much water retention there would be you know in the different areas. So <laughs> some of the areas that have the dark tan base you know has not so much greenery in them. You know you got to really look look in closely like there's there's a some sandstone over here so this plant is not particularly well uh, well nourished you know compared to on the corner where there's probably more uh, condensation and more dew is able to to collect in fog. Yeah, there's a, the idea that in the morning you know a fog layer comes through here, so some some areas will be more damp naturally. The trees, eh, you know, there's a little bit of variety to them. There's there's an the idea that they would have some different different species, but I'm not great at at tree building um, just yet. And I kind of wanted to to fill up. I, I I wanted to make sure that this was this was green again and not just not gray. So. Spend some time just you know making making foliage, and then also thinking, like I said, about drainage and water collects down in this little little valley in the middle. It's just a little little pool in it, and ultimately this I should do I should do the trick. Sorry, Bimo's in the background going <laughs> going crazy, but he'll be he'll be all right. I should try to do the trick. Where's the best place for me to do that? I think it's here, here and here. The trick, yeah. 
think I probably I might I might break one of these trees, but it's okay. It's it's worth it. Oh, it's this one. This one needs to move. <laughs> Let me move this so, one. Some things have to be sacrificed. You because know. <laughs> this is where this is where trains get to come through and switch between the different layouts. And thus, Ooh. if there's ever a derailment, I need to be able to access that and get in there and fix it. So that lets you see how it's actually built on the inside. A lot of a lot of Duplo. Look at all that beautiful Duplo we yeah. get to see. Forget the gray. <laughs> yeah. There's your color. There's your color. There's the, the, the real child in me coming, coming out. It had to be accessible. Yeah. Because if I didn't have this, if I didn't have the, the ability to, to get in there like this, for sure, the first time that I, that I run through here, a, a train would derail right there. Now, because I have these accessible spots, there's another big removable area on the other side. I won't pull that one out, but... Uh, you know, just in case something gets stuck down there, uh, a large part of that corner can be popped up as well. Because I've got the accessibility, I'm good. I will never have a derailment in Murphy's Law, guaranteed. <laughs> no, and that's such, that's such a good reminder and something that I try to mention as much as possible on the channel is when you're building, whether for yourself at home or planning to, especially if you want to take it to a convention or show of some kind, yeah. you've got to keep things like that in mind. And yeah. you, you can't just build a giant block of something because right. it's like you said you know something's going to go wrong and then yeah. you can't access it yeah. and at that point you're stuck so it's it's a really good tip and a good reminder for people that i uh, it's you can kind of never have too much accessibility accessibility with it's it's so important not just not just for when things go wrong but when things go right you know being able to get to being able to get to a spot just having Everything within reach, you know, being able to literally get there and grab things. If I needed to move this, so this is one entire building here. If I needed to move this, if I had put it out in the middle with not as much room to, to walk around, I would have to be climbing on top, you know, to, to get to it. And then what if I had built up this area here with some trees? You know, this is eventually going to get detailed. So, yeah, you're, that's, a, that's a really, really good point is make sure that it's comfortable for you as a builder to be able to get into everything that, that you've done. Don't ever think of anything as being permanent. Otherwise, it kind of will become permanent in a, in a bad way. And right. It, you know, it'll become limiting. Now, of course, as we move beyond that to this corner section here, we come to the promised trains and a yeah. lot more of them. Yeah. So talk about kind of your, your philosophy behind the layout and your approach to thinking. When, when, you're, when you're building this over the years, mm -hmm. is your goal to get as much of the train stuff on the tables as possible and work everything else around that? Or is it kind of work the trains into what into the other buildings, kind of a mixture of everything? How do you think about that? I have been, I've been really conflicted and only recently have I really become true to myself on that exact topic. I want this to be fundamentally a train layout with city stuff to go with it. Ultimately, what I've tried to create here is a, a Lego version of an HO scale train layout, uh, you know, just filled in with the medium being, being Lego previously. When I first started, when I first put Ikea tables down at my, my previous house, I put a rail loop around it. You know, that was the start because ultimately at my, in my heart, I knew that that was key to me. But as I've changed things through, through the years, I've gone through different phases, I've kind of pushed the rail stuff back. A lot of viewers have, have wanted me to, to focus more on things other, other than rail, and I've listened to that sometimes, but finally I've just accepted. I like trains, man. <laughs> yeah, it's, I like trains There's a no lot. use denying it. Yeah. <laughs> and so the, literally one of the most recent changes that I made here, just kind of solidifying the, the overall table layout change, is bringing the, the passenger train uh, yard, which is gonna have a little, uh, a large actually maintenance uh, shed going over the, the area that's a little bit closer to us. Uh, that's been moved over here. Previously, it, it was hidden on the back side of, of the tables as far away from, from view as possible because mm -hmm. it was kind of like pushing all the, all the train stuff in, in one direction. But now, you know, when we were down there in the middle of the tables, you got access to it immediately. You can look in this, look towards this corner, and you just see trains. I've got the, the freight, um, uh, the freight engine shed over here. You know, engine maintenance shed with, with the two bays, and I can I can have up to four locomotives in there getting getting worked on. That's lit up with a combination of the the brick stuff lights and some custom lights, uh, custom, custom wired in. Um, yeah, and then you know the, the the yards, 
all my custom cars. I'm going to be doing, of course, more custom rolling stock. A uh, bunch of the engines, especially the, the freight engines, are new since the last time you were here. Yeah, that one, I think that's that's the most recent one that I did right there. It's I like, love the striping technique oh, there. Oh, that's man. so I, good. I beat myself up <laughs> trying to come up with the stripes because I tried to do them you know, off off grid with, mm -hmm. with tiles and figure out a way to get the, the cheese graters to create the angle and it just wasn't working and I just went I just went old school with it. So that's that's inspired by uh, 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 like a second generation no not second generation it's mid, middle generation uh, Southern Pacific uh, livery back from the steam era, uh, but obviously the the engine itself is is more of a modern American style not based on any one specific engine but I just Lego has done so little modern Americana for for trains they've done the Maersk they've done the uh, the blue uh, cargo train set from City from like 2014 ish, and then before that you got to go back to the BNSF um, engine, and I think that's about it. And it's like one of the most common types of, of of locomotive hardware on the planet. You know, pulling more freight than most in the world. And yeah. yeah, I feel like they just have too little representation for that. So I got that one, and then the uh, second to newest engine is this one which is also inspired by southern pacific which doesn't exist anymore but where i grew up as a kid was right near a southern pacific yard so that red nose look was <laughs> that was trains that was one of the the main connections visual connections that i had with with trains as a kid so i had to get some representation for that in there and again just a you know a made-up design but you know inspired by rolling stock that you might see on on the, the railroads locally. And then other stuff is mostly just kind of kind of random, mixed up. That thing right there is weird <laughs> that you're looking at right now. That, that, that actually has the power. See, it's got three trucks. It's uh, three sets of wheels. Okay. And the power is from the middle, the middle <laughs> set. And so in order for that to be able to go around turns, it has to be able to shift that, that middle uh, set of powered wheels can shift all around. To, to deal with Lego's weird and super, super tight radius of, of, uh, of turns. That's one thing for all of my rail, I use just Lego's original, um, you know, original rail, rail pieces. And it's nine volt powered, so I don't have to worry about recharging batteries or anything. But by not using aftermarket uh, tracks, I do have to deal with the really, really tight turns that they have. And it kind of kind of limits what what you can do uh, as far as realism of, of train setups and some of the turn turnoffs are weird and stuff, but I make it work. It's, it's set up pretty decently right now. It's fairly comfortable with a separate loop for the, for the, the cargo and industrial side, separate loop for the, the, uh, uh, the urban area, you know, on, on the ground main, main loop, and they're able to connect. So with the connectors of the tables, I'm able to to run them through the through the big tunnels um, in either either direction, and then ultimately do a big loop around the entire layout. Maybe maybe a little bit later, we'll be able to see some of the oh, yeah. trains running. Get, get some of that in action. But that's always the ultimate kind of Lego train fan goal, isn't it? To do like the big loop around yeah. everything. Like yeah. that's when you know you've really met your goal. Yeah. <laughs> that's so cool, and it's so much fun. I love to hear kind of the, the way you've thought about that and adapted over the years. Another little smaller detail I like here is the way you changed out the base plate color. And so it creates just kind of uh, a really, you know, casual kind of transition as you go into this area and you even use kind of the bush pieces there and stuff. So it gives the idea of this train area being a little more remote than some of mm -hmm. the other areas that we've looked at. And it creates that kind of nice effect um, as you transition kind of throughout the whole layout here. Yeah, and, and you know you know how how these things progress. You know, you you start at, you start at a high level, and everything is very very blocky. But over time, it starts to get smoothed in, and it all starts to make sense. So you've got you've got the the experience to to have seen that that process from from a lot of people. But I, I think I think it 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 it's not immediately obvious sometimes to a casual viewer looking at it, seeing you know, okay, there's no base plates here. What what is that? You know, it's just unfinished. But yeah, there is ultimately a uh, overarching goal for for the whole thing to have it 
feel like different regions and feel transitions of regions of different types of foliage, of different amounts of rainfall collection and different types of, of, of surface, you know, dirt and bitumen and, you know, the street areas and areas that aren't, aren't, uh, aren't prepared quite as much. I do something that's not very common with the, with the, the track. So I keep my tracks down just about as low as possible. They're only one single uh, tile up. And then my, my ballast is just one single layer of, of, of uh, plates. Um, it makes it much more difficult to set that in. It becomes a lot more permanent than the typical you know, three, three layers mm -hmm. uh, set up. But it just, it just works for me if not having that much extra height. Because then when I get to cross crossings, you know, street crossings, I don't have to go up super high. And with everything being based on base plates here, which you know, a lot of folks these days move towards mills, but I'm really, really happy sticking with, with just the base plates. It's worked out well and allowed me to change a whole lot of things with, with the layout very, very easily. And I'm kind of kind of comfortable with with the systems that are that are in place. Yeah, way less parts intensive for sure. Yeah, the, this this one I would imagine. Yeah, just a lot a lot less to be to be lost mm -hmm. if I if I decide to completely blow out an entire area <laughs> and start from scratch. <laughs> Well, very nice. So I'm, I'm glad we're able to cover some of that. So I think we'll stop now. Maybe go back uh, to the other side here yeah. and continue our journey through the city. So from from the train yard. So again, I've got the cargo yard, you know, like classification yard and the passenger yard. That's all bringing us into the industrial zone and kind of the the big terrain feature that we were looking at earlier is the the separator. And again, with the idea of proportions being weird, you can just imagine that being a, a large span of, of hills it might be a mile or, or two or something you know just to to give us more of that that space that makes a little bit more more sense to get away from skyscrapers to like factory so the octan factory in in my lego world uh, octan doesn't do energy related stuff they don't do oil and, and gas anymore uh, they've become the world's leading supplier of coffee mugs <laughs> Okay, you know, a little bit of a rebrand. <laughs> yeah, you know, they're, 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 they, they've made their they've made their adjustments. So that's why I got the big coffee coffee mug build outside of their <laughs> their corporate office over there. Uh, but yeah, the the mall actually has a has a uh, a corner little uh, uh, merch shop that has all different types of <laughs> mugs that they make, as well as some references. Because they still they still in universe they still respect their their legacy, their history. So they still have like racing memorabilia, you know, like the the ra race car uh, outfits and and helmets and, and all that kind of stuff. Because you know, I wanted to still use some of the old printed pieces and things, but yeah, this this doesn't have anything on the inside of it. But yeah. You know, the the idea is there solidly. The I call this the Blau House because it's 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 blue. It's <laughs> it's building, but it also takes a little bit of inspiration from from the the Bauhaus movement uh, architecturally. Just 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 a little bit. Just 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 a little bit. This this was this was literally something that I created because I had way too much stuff in my general medium and light blue colored colored uh, bin of parts. Yeah. And yeah, I just I just wanted to use the pieces and have have something that, that had that color that hadn't been used before. Well, you do that kind of thing very often, where you just sit down with maybe a bunch of a certain color or type of piece, and it's like, what can I do with this? Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Because you know, as uh, I I used to keep almost all the sets that I would review. I would just you know we would take them take them apart, and then I got those pieces. What am I going to do with those pieces? If the bin gets full. And I can't even close the bin anymore. I got to do something with it. Right. So I, in, in times like that, I'll actually pick from a, from a bin based based on the color first. Yeah, that works great. And I, I just this this guy up here caught my eye as well with the tire there. Freddy the tire yeti. <laughs> it just it just it just worked for me. You know the uh, was it's not the Goodyear guy. Who was it? The BF Goodrich. Who's the who's the tire? The, the the tire the tire guy from the from like a major tire supplier. Why do I forget now? He was like a he looked like a Pillsbury. Yeah, he was guy. like made of tires. Uh, yeah. What is yeah? I can't remember his name, but I know Dang who you're it. talking about. That's that's my version of it. I had to get a shell station in here. 
Um, it's it's in it's in flux right now. It's in the process of changing a little bit with the with the change to the to the layout. It needs to be needs to be adjusted. Sorry about Bimo in the background. <laughs> He'll be okay. But the the shell station uh, shell stations and also Exxon stations uh, from from the 80s and early 90s the things that I just really liked the look of. They tied into to cars. They kind of tied the minifig life into cars and racing, which was just something that I always liked as, as a kid. And I, I had to get a little piece of that into, into my city. So it's, yeah, it's just, you know, using, again, old, old prints, old stickers, and a little bit of inspiration from stuff that I've seen in real life. This one takes most inspiration from a, uh, a station that was in uh, San Leandro that I used to stop by on, on the way to, to work. But, um, yeah, it's got, you know, just your regular pumps and then the convenience store. And this one also has attached to it a, a garage, you know, a service, service station, little space, which needs to be uh, reduced in size. So right now it's overlapping onto the street because I just changed how the street was done. So it's going to be reduced down just to, to one, uh, one bay. And then the, uh, uh, the car wash, which was previously behind that, is being shifted over to this side. And it'll just, yeah, it'll fit in, fit in a lot better. And also give me a little bit of space for my, my uh, tow trucks. Got a little towing company is going to be, yeah, taking up, uh, taking up business in this, in this corner. <laughs> I love this shell station so much. I think it represents so much of kind of the beauty of your whole layout here because it's got that personal element you mentioned. You know, there is a, a real life place that kind of ties in with your yeah. life, but it also respects, you know, the history of Lego and shell and like what they've done over the years and yeah. the fact that, you know, they had that relationship and everything. So you kind of recognize that history too. And then just makes for a great looking, you know, set piece. You need gas stations for the city. So it, it combines up so many of these fantastic elements that you've hit on kind of as we've gone around the city here. And I think that's part of what makes this, you know, so appealing. And, uh, you know, as you've done this over the years, I think it keeps people coming back to, to see more and to see what you continue to update. I'm, I'm, and I'm glad that I'm able to, to keep, definitely, you know, as I make big major changes, I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to do the Star Wars thing and leave the past behind. Kill it if you have to. <laughs> in, in this case, as much as possible, I try to keep the stuff that I personally liked and that and that viewers have liked. I try to keep that alive, even if something has to be changed a bunch. You know, I'll keep the pieces of it. Like with the with the uh, the police station, I literally used as many pieces as, of the original as I could, even though I didn't like how the old one looked anymore. I try to keep all the the best stuff from it. And gosh, that's beautiful thing about Lego is that you literally can keep the pieces <laughs> and use them again for something else. Yes. <laughs> such a win. No, that's, that's, that's such a wonderful thing about it. So that's really, really cool there. And I want to make sure we, we don't skip out on some other great train stuff here. So, uh, John, I don't know if it's easier for you to come back around here or not as we talk about these, but what, what is this section? Yeah. So this is the, the other major uh, passenger train station. So we've got you know, one on the completely on the other side of the world. You know, it's like next county over kind of thing. So I just wanted to have the idea of not only intra-city uh, transport, but also, you know, going out to the to the next town or maybe to to another town. Yeah. So this is just yeah, also a little bit inspired by something from from my childhood, specifically this little area here with the the booth and this weird uh, polar bear statue thing <laughs> off, off to the side or inspired by uh, uh, Bay Area rapid transit stations that were built back in the late 60s and early 70s. So just, and then even the, the colors used for the tiling down there, just some of it just looks very, very dated, very, very intentionally. You know, <laughs> I, I, I personally kind of hate that, that era as far as how things looked and the colors that they used. But there's also a certain romance to it, you know, like it was it was a slice of, of life and a slice of time. And, you know, that stuff doesn't go away immediately, you know, it lasted into the 80s. It was not wasn't until the 90s that stuff started getting retrofitted, you know. And yeah, just again, having a little bit more different, different flavor, you know, it's just it just feels feels good. Yeah. It, and it feels bad in a good kind of way. Like <laughs> this is bad design but it's also kind of cool, you know, <laughs> ugly, cute kind of, kind of thing. I also, um, I want to point out that I wanted to think about accessibility. Like again, thinking about the, the minifigures perspective, it's something that, that 
is limiting, but it's limiting also in, in real life. It's you got to think about you know different differently abled people, and I think about that with with the with the minifigs as well. So every single time I do some something major, I've got to have it access for for wheelchairs to to be able to be lifted. So in this case, just a just a short little lift, you know, a little what is it five in universe five six feet or something mm -hmm. to to be able to lift up. But I'm always thinking about you know, where am I going to put at least an elevator. Uh, and also, you know, staircases for, for normally abled folks as, as well, but it, that takes up a lot more more space. It's nice. It's nice to be able to be a little bit more more thoughtful. Again, keeping in mind that in this world, the minifigs are real people. You know, so being being uh, accommodating to as many of them as possible it's, adds an extra challenge, and also I think makes me allows me to feel a little bit more connected to them. Like I'm actually trying to be empathetic with, you know, with these little plastic, plastic dudes. From a certain perspective, it kind of sounds weird, but it, it kind of works because ultimately this isn't for them and it's not for me, it's for, for the viewers, you know, and, and it really helps to, it, whether intentionally or not, to make that connection with, with real people and they can say, oh, hey, I can use this, this train platform, thank you, kind of thing, you know. Mm -hmm. I also love the parts technique here that you did with kind of these gate type pieces on their side. Um, so normally you just kind of put those in the studs, but uh, mm -hmm. you've got them I think, clipped in there and then sticking up so mm -hmm. it kind of creates that nice background. Yeah, one, one technique used there, I, I, I just had a bunch of those <laughs> pieces and I wanted to see if I could do something that looked a little bit unusual there and also that kind of fit the, fit the theme and then I did a slightly different style out here because, well, frankly, I, I, I ran out of this type of fence piece and had to do something else and that that look right there that design is so so 60s so like late 60s it, it, i didn't intend for it to be that awful and good but <laughs> it just kind of accidentally worked you out. just captured a certain like a feel an element there. <laughs> that's great though it's like you said you know it's a part of the history so you want to yeah. represent that yeah yeah <laughs> And as we move kind of across the street then, um, of course you've got the streets themselves where you've got a lot of these different kind of vehicles set up mm -hmm. and giving that sense of kind of action and life to the whole city, which is great as well. Yeah, the, the vehicles are something that I can, I can always do. Like if I, if I don't have creative inspiration and, or I don't have a whole lot of time to sit down and, and work on stuff, but I, I wanna do something for the city, I'll just build a, a car or something. Uh, these are, these, wow, they go, Throughout my, actually, I think some of these I did before the city even began. Uh, the, the Jeep that you were just looking at was was a was an old one. You can see yellowed yellowed old parts on it and everything. But yeah, so over time, I've I've kept almost everything that I've done vehicle wise. Some of them are, some of them honestly are kind of weak by today's standards. But you know, they're mine. It's part of my part of my journey. <laughs> you know, it, it works. That one right there, uh, I actually put some some extra extra time into. That one does represent a very specific uh, vehicle. It represents a Lada Neva, which is a <laughs> a junk heap of a of a car in real life, but also super super awesome. Uh, it's a subcompact car designed in Russia. That's a four wheel drive, like not all wheel drive, four wheel drive. Super, super lifted for just the worst backcountry roads or non roads. You know, it's, it's like a, it's like a, like a full on off roader, but a subcompact, you know, tin can kind of, kind of car. <laughs> and it's just one of those, those things that's just so awful and it's so awesome at the same time. So I just, for some reason, I just got a kick and just went, did a lot of Neva. Because <laughs> it needed to happen. Exactly. Just like with the trains, you can take inspiration for the vehicles from yeah. all over the place. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but yeah, there's you know random random minifigures um, that are not truly random, but that are you know they have some some thought in them. Uh, some of the vehicles have multiple occupants, and I think about like what is the familial. Uh, you know, relationship between them. And, you know, it looks like a mom, a mom and a daughter, but it, it's no, it's actually the aunt. <laughs> <laughs> now you've got the lineage all wrong there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's just coming up with those backstories. That's so neat. And then this is the the fire station, which is partially inspired by a real fire station in Hayward, California, near uh, 
on, on the way to where I used to do another hobby before, before I was uh, deeper into, into Lego, which was radio control cars. Uh, just this mostly, honestly, mostly the tan uh, is, is taken from there. And other than that, I just kind of built this one function first, like created the bays for the, for the trucks first. And then the, I don't, I don't, I mean, I, I don't have any family members that are in, in fire or anything. I don't really know how they work. I've looked at pictures and I like the looks of the equipment and stuff, but I don't know the stuff, <laughs> but it looks really cool. And I, you know, I of course, have much res much respect for for firefighters. One of my neighbors is uh, is in San Francisco, uh, fire de fire department. But yeah, you know, it's just uh, Lego City, police, fire. Okay, gotta have some representation of that. The, so this guy here also seems to be struggling with how these things work. <laughs> yeah, as well. he, he's he's actually he's he's a veteran, but he, he can be clumsy from time to time. That's actually a a. a a, a real person too, a real firefighter. He's a, I mean, he's a, a Patreon member, so he, he wanted me to, to, put, to put him in with a, a little, a little comic relief, and I went a little extra with it. One thing that's really neat is you've got some uh, rather unique firefighting elements. So there's the rolling train, and then this fire train, <laughs> like fire submarine, submarine. There we go. <laughs> because hey, you know, there's just not enough representation for fighting fires under the water so that had to happen because that totally makes sense right oh yeah yeah i mean you've got to be able to get to those fires under the water <laughs> we've got you know oh the, don't forget don't forget the fire bicycle <laughs> this guy rolls up you know how they mean business <laughs> it's such like a andy griffith vibe or something to exactly, that exactly like... <laughs> i think i think there have been actual fire bicycles in in real life i don't i don't know what they did maybe they had just like a little tank of of water at like back in the 1920s or something i mean if there but, were like bucket lines i mean anything goes where you're just trying i mean i guess what, whatever you can do to try to get yeah, water yeah. somewhere that, you know stuff like that is, is mostly just making fun of, of how we you know we see lego's always doing another police helicopter and right. fire this and that you know so i just i just i just kind of leaned into that a little bit so i've got my i've got my semi-realistic uh, equipment pieces that are sorry they're they're kind of inside right now but then you know doing some more whimsical stuff as as well keeping it keeping it keeping it silly i love that the fire bell here is represented by like a trophy cup <laughs> yeah i don't remember which theme that that came from that's the that's the uh, the drum lacquered one too mhm mm Kind of, kind of rare these days. I think fancy stuff. But yeah, I just, I, don't, I, I just, I just had to, I had to use the piece. This, this actually, all that structure there is is going to be rebuilt at some point. I'm not super happy with it, but the whole thing still brings enough joy to keep. This, on the other hand, this had to be completely redone because I had the space for it. In 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 the new room, I had enough space for a, a much larger zoo. Zoo, I did it my first zoo build was completed surely by 2015 maybe 2014 and it was less than half this size um, and there were a lot less animals available from lego at that time you know the the mold the animal molds they've just exploded over the past decade which is fantastic so being able to to use a lot more of those and also being able to just open up the space a lot this is very very much work in progress but it's getting there it's one of the major projects that I've been working on most, most recently. And the, the overall idea here was for us, I call us huge figures, us real human <laughs> beings, to be able to, to stand up and look at the whole thing and, and see what looks like a cartoon map. Like if, if, if we had a, a line art drawn or a vector art drawn map of a, of a zoo, it would look like this, you know, with the, the animals being much larger than they would be mm -hmm. in real life and the really, really obvious colors and shaping to the point where it almost looks like there are continents that have been formed. You know, think of this as think of this as C, yeah. the, the pathways being C. And then just, you know, there's this continent here and there's, there's this is Antarctica <laughs> over here, you know, part of Africa is, is kind of separated in, in this view. You know, it's not necessarily trying to be real world, but that kind of world building type of yeah, idea for sure. Yeah. yeah. To, to create the different the different regions, and I just finished rebuilding my my aviary uh, this past week. 
It's mostly based on the original the original design that I had for it, just using those fantastic Belleville. I think it was was it wait, was it Belleville or was it Paradisa? I think it was Paradisa that first introduced those. Big cafe yeah. window type of yeah, idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's just such beautiful parts, you know, and being able to see from every angle inside, and then you know, using a bunch of of the more modern available birds and bird-like things, including like fox from. Uh, uh, from Harry Potter, I can actually rotate this around for you, <laughs> is in there and, and trying to combine different, different styles uh, from anything from the classic original parrot to the scarecrow, cr uh, crow piece from the scarecrow and also uh, Lone Ranger ta oh, yeah. Tonto, uh, you know, accessory piece. And yeah, just having visibility all around. You see the train coming through here? The idea, and there are actually a couple of those. There's, there's one over here and one on one on the other other side. But the idea for those is that it's not an actual train; it's a road train, you know, where it's all rubber rubber oh, tires, right. and there's an actual driver for it. So I really, really wanted to have yet another train on, <laughs> on the layout, um, but I wasn't able to make an actual rail system fit in here. I tried. I looked at it from a couple different perspectives, several different perspectives, and ultimately just had to to just accept that I'm limited on space and just go with something that does exist in real life. You know, oh, yeah, a lot of zoos uh, and just kind of like kid-oriented places mm -hmm. will have that type of mm -hmm. riding experience where it's like hop on the train and yeah. you even themed the cars, which you see a lot of that type exactly. of thing. And exactly. I can remember growing up and doing those types of rides as a kid. It's like, oh, yeah. not only am I at a zoo, but I get to ride on a train mm -hmm. now? I mean, mm -hmm. it doesn't get any better than that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I just I just made the the smallest size that I could, and then made sure that there was a pathway for them to be able to semi realistically be able to get around. So I can pose them, you know, over time I can move them around around the spaces, and yeah, just from from a high level, it's kind of desert arid area over here with the with the ostrich and the camels and the most recent Lego Friends uh, giraffe, which replaces my brick built one. Uh, finally. This area here is going to be built up with uh, monkeys and, and apes sorts of things, including even Momo the lemur from, uh, from Avatar Last Airbender. Uh, uh, Antarctic kind of, kind of space over here, which is way, way too tight, but I've, I've, got, I've got an explanation for that. I'm not ready to explain how that's going to work and how these animals are going to be safe with each other, but I've, I've got it figured out to, to, to be... Continued. There we <laughs> go. Keep, keep watching everyone in the future. <laughs> uh, bears, bears off here in, in the corner, just a few different types of bears. I got the, the big cats, uh, which was the first area that I actually completed. I'm pretty happy with how that's all come together and just kind of showing the, the level of detail and level of, of completion. Uh, the, gosh, they came out with the, the big cat molds and it was just fantastic. The, the variety you probably don't see because he's hiding, but back there in the corner, is the, the black leopard as well, or, or black panther as we sometimes incorrectly refer to them. <laughs> <laughs> you're, yeah. you're here to correct some myths along the way. <laughs> I, if I don't, the, the, the comments will. So you might as well get on top of it. And then just a little bit of like Nile inspired area here. And then underneath the big rock on the other side is the aquarium. Oh. <laughs> We'll have to check that out. I did want to mention as well, though. I see you trying to kind of hide out right here. The we've got the goat element. We got we got to mention the goat. I know he's trying to hide. I'm, I'm like pushing everything off the. T let's go to the other corner. Let's let's go over there. We're looking that way now, and then. All right. I know. I just had to do it. I I feel physical pain every time I think about the goat issue. I see. Dude, seriously, all we want is a goat. We just want another goat. Goats most recently on BrickLink are up to like $90 US now. It's ridiculous. It is insane, yeah, yeah. Like the goat <laughs> trader market is like <laughs> it, It's thing. way outpaced the actual goat <laughs> economy. <laughs> we, looked, we looked at it, we looked at it uh, online because they're, they're on Twitch, like there are a couple people who actually raise goats and they do live, <laughs> live goat, um, uh, maintenance and milking and stuff, and we talked talk to folks from that community. And yeah, you can get, in, in some places in the United States, you can get two kids fully uh, good to go, you know, medically cleared and everything, good, ready, to, ready to adopt. 
for the price of one Lego goat. <laughs> Two actual goats. <laughs> Real live goats. Love how you, you did the math there. <laughs> yes. For the price of one little Lego goat. I know there's like the rumor with the, the, the survey that went around that showed a, a new medieval market, maybe possibly perhaps being considered or something, but we'll, we'll, believe, we'll believe that fully if it actually becomes truly true. But for now, we're in a goatless situation. I'm very angry about it, and I don't want to talk about it. Okay, we'll move on. <laughs> There's a lot of emotion this layout brings to you as well. But now we are going into something very different here. So we kind of transition using that mountain backdrop, which sort of serves as a backdrop for the zoo, into this large base here. So what yeah. is this? So this is very, very incomplete, but this... Uh, this ultimately extends from what was going to be my original Lego layout, which was classic space inspired before I had the YouTube channel, or at least before I did anything uh, brick, brick based related. It was just on the top of a mantle, I had, had a space um, two houses ago. <laughs> a big wide open space, and I just wanted to, to do some classic space inspiration up there. And I wanted to keep it gray. I know that sounds very, very boring, but I just, the idea of that, that, that old Star Wars 70s, you know, gray spaceships kind of look, I just wanted to really lean into that. And I've kept that dream alive. I've not made it fully come, come true yet, but you just kind of see some components here that have been built up over, over the years. And the idea is the whole thing is kind of inspired, the whole, the whole setting here is kind of inspired by Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Um, it's called Devil's Peak is the, is the actual place. I forget which, which, um, which state it's in? It's a it's a lacolith. It's a particular geological formation. It's, hmm. it's not a it's not a volcano, but it's 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 formed from ancient volcanic activity followed by erosion, and then inside of that is is the not so hidden uh, military force and, and space <laughs> space base for the city. So it's it's not truly it's not truly secretive. Uh, citizens are kept out of it. Um, it's really none of, none of the business of the citizenry what's going on back here, but they all know it exists and they appreciate it because you know it's it's keeping like aliens out of the out of the city because you you know you got to be prepared yeah. otherwise you know you know there have been a lot of alien uh, series that Lego has done through the years. Any one of those could invade at any just time. Show up on the doorstep <laughs> exactly, of the city and exactly. you'd be totally undefended. If I just, if I just happen to be looking through Brickset and I see one come up as the random set of the day, like, oh, those green guys look really cool. I think I'm going to bring that in. So <laughs> these, guys are, these guys are ready. Some of this stuff is, is really old. Some of it is relatively new. I think the newest things that I've built here are the, the mechs. So I've got four, four mechs that use the same basic frame. And that's, that's me taking inspiration from, a, from another hobby that I recently got into, just on, on the side of, of building Gundam uh, plastic models from, from Japan. Uh, I do a, just a little bit of streaming of that on, on Twitch or putting it together. I've got a bunch of models put together, but I didn't... A lot of people say, well, why don't you combine the two? Like, do Lego Gundam. And plenty of people do that. You know, a lot of folks are, are actually really, really... <gasps> Good catch. <laughs> really fantastic at, at doing amazing mech stuff, but I just wanted to take inspiration from some of the new things that I had experienced in that hobby of how, how articulation, you know, how much articulation you can actually get out of a small space, a small amount of, of plastic. And yeah, so I, I didn't try to make Lego Gundams. I just tried to make my own mechs and they ended up being very similar to what's in uh, uh, Avatar, right? James Cameron, mm -hmm. Cameron's Avatar, which was not intentional at all, but they have crazy amounts of articulation to them. And I just had fun with relatively modern parts. It's just, it's so fantastic that Lego these days is making more and more tiny, tiny pieces with a lot of functionality. You know, direction changes, switching back and forth between clip and bar and stud, you know, open, open studs, the different shapes of droid arms and stuff. So yeah, I just had a lot of, a lot of fun kind of doing a uh, form follows function approach to it and then just putting a skin on top of them and thinking of different different uh, different specializations for them like this one over here has twin rail guns compared to this one's more of like point uh, precision uh, yeah and then a utility one as well you know that can be used for working on the hulls of big big spaceships speaking of of which this being a planetary defense force base 
they do have big ships. They will be built at some point. But until I've got the big ones built, I've got little versions of them. So the idea is eventually I will have, um, I'll, I'll hang from the ceiling just to kind of show off in the distance some of their, some of their big, like, uh, Corsair. So this is, I don't know what scale, it's basically just a nano scale version. Mm -hmm. And eventually I'll make a, a significantly larger version of that. And then this is a, an even smaller, or maybe micro scale, nano scale version so that I can do a forced perspective thing. They should not be sitting right here. You know, it's, it really breaks the illusion, but eventually they'll have those hanging from, from the ceiling and just be able to, to see the, the overwatch of the, of the city. And yeah. It, they've really got everything protected. That will be super cool and it'll create kind of even more of like a, a 3D effect as you walk around the city here to yeah. have it, you know, stuff hanging as well. Yeah. It really brings I've, it all together. I've got a couple planes that I've done too that, I've, that I'm just, just not able to, to show on tours like this because they're you know, back in, in the other room, but I've got a, a, a modified, highly customized version of a big uh, passenger liner, and then I've got a, a smaller like four, four passenger plane that I've done as, as well. So I definitely look, look forward to having the confidence at some point to start, start hanging those up and like you said, add, add more dimension. And especially, uh, given that I'm, I'm able to create different different moods in the room with with the the lighting, I invested really heavily early on in the lighting to be able to switch us to like, for example, <laughs> more of a more of a nighttime sort of scene. Which, you know, eventually I'll have like a, a moon light up there as well, and just uh, this really allows the the lighting in the in the buildings to to shine and to to really bring more of a sense of, of life to, to the space when you, when you see that it's not, it's not just in kind of a studio, a studio, it's not just in somebody's house. It's actually, you know, there's, there's life there and that they've, they've thought about, they've thought about the, uh, you know, the, the utilities mm -hmm. and everything. It just brings a, a, a light lighting just, it's it just a, makes everything pop so much. Yeah. It's, it really just adds such that I always said that and movement are the two things when mm -hmm. we're at, you know just walking around a convention full of builds. Those are the two elements that will always make a build stand out yeah. the most. What is it about lighting in particular? Because you know we with Lego in particular, you have so many shapes and colors. Like these are major things that have, that affect our perception. But but light, even even small bits of it, just really takes things to, to another level. It's unfortunate that it's so difficult because of the, the way that every, with Lego, everything so tightly interconnects. It's difficult to run wiring. You, know, that's, it, you really have to think about it in advance. Or if you're adding lighting to, to a setting or to, to a build after the fact, you have to take so much apart to create the, the pathways for the, for the wires. And then to consider, are you gonna use it like USB? style for more longevity or you're just going to use small batteries so that you don't have to wire things as, as far and but then you have to worry about changing out batteries you have to worry about uh you know turning them on and off yeah. all, all the time all that kind of stuff so it definitely adds a whole lot of complexity uh, to it which is why i appreciate you know companies that that do original designs of of systems that work that are compatible as, as compatible as possible with Lego with really small connectors and things, but still you really have to put in a lot of extra work to make it happen. That's, and that's, that's the only reason that I don't have a lot of this lit up, but the parts that are lit up, like you said, really, it adds a lot. And if, if we, if we come back around this, this side, there's one additional thing that I wanted to show you where I'm most, I'm personally most happy with the lighting. If we go just down below. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> this is the aquarium that's, you mentioned. That's the aquarium. <laughs> so it's accessible by, the, by the, the train, the zoo train that comes through and it's showing just a little, we're actually looking through the, the Lackalith, the, the hill, the mountain, a cut a cutout of this aquarium that's been built in. You know, it's been tunneled in, dug out and fully built out inside the, inside the mountain. Uh, I did an aquarium for my original zoo that was probably, I don't know, the total space was maybe 16 by 16, you know, with a, with a cutout in the middle. This is, I don't know, four or five times that large and just uses every sing, every 
different style of and era of marine life that I could find that, that Lego has made within reason. I could put more in there, but I didn't want it to be too too crazy. Just different different colors, different shapes. Again, really focusing in on on uh, custom builds for some coral and coral like things. This is one of my favorite areas. We've literally saved the best for last. One of my favorite areas in the whole city, just because I've always liked the look of of uh, of marine, you know, saltwater uh, aquariums and, uh, you know, underwater coral reef kind of spaces. It just, there's just so much natural beauty there. The movement is, is slow, you know, the way that things move through water. And I just, I'm uh, really happy to have been able to capture some of that here. And again, the, the lighting is absolutely key because without that, you know, it would just be a dark space yeah. in there. <laughs> what I love about this is you've captured that kind of immense feeling with so much life going on that uh, I think people have been to aquariums. Like we recently visited the Georgia Aquarium in Atlanta, which is just like one of the best aquariums in yes. the country. Yes. And there's definitely exhibits like this where you sit down like the, the minifig that you've got sitting uh -huh. there in front of it and you just feel that like immense feeling of so much happening around you and yeah. being able to take this like snapshot of a whole another underwater world that makes it so fascinating to look at. So you've captured that very nicely. Thank you. And there's a feeling in the air, right? When you're in mm -hmm. a space, because the, the the you know sound sound doesn't travel as as far. It, it deadens out. There's just a you can feel the weight of the of the water against the against the windows, right? It's just it like I said, it, it's immense. There's a there's a presence there that you just kind of have to sit and just take in, just let it <laughs> let it seep into you through us through osmosis that's fantastic do you do you have a favorite uh, like aquarium yourself or like one you visited growing up or anything that you've always had an attachment the, to the Mon monterey bay is you know is the the most convenient big big one to mm -hmm. get to get to in this in this region um yeah you know, we've got we've got a little one over in san francisco we got a couple of of uh spots to uh there's the uh Oh gosh, I don't remember the name now. I'm sorry, brain failure. Um, <laughs> but there's one that you, where you can actually go into the bay it, itself, okay. at, Pier, at Pier 39, and then um, uh, one that's that's switched. I'm sorry, the name's just no. That's me, fine. Yeah, yeah. Skipping me, but uh, actually took in some inspiration from from one of those spots for uh, one of the exhibits in the zoo as as well. They've got a albino uh, crocodile, or is it alligator? I think it's a I think it's an albino alligator actually in there. So I, when Lego actually made one of those, I was, I was happy to be able to bring that little piece of, of life, real life into it as well. But yeah, the lights, uh, color, modern pieces, classic pieces, and uh, the accessibility and the ability to be a human being in this space and just experience the idea of, of what it's like for, for a minifigure, it all comes together in little, little spots like that. <laughs> no, it's so, it's so wonderful, yeah. And then, of course, the train runs through there yeah. as well. Yeah. And as we make our way back around the corner, look at that, wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's such an adaptive space. <laughs> And we can appreciate your, your rock work out here as well. I know we talked uh, more in depth about that earlier, but once again, you know, uh, it creates kind of some elevation, which is great, mm -hmm. and just mm -hmm. kind of variety. You can see how you use the different grayscale colors there as well. Yeah, this, this one's not that, Im that impressive. I mean, you can see that it's, you know, it's based on lots of, lots of burps, but, you know, I think, I think it, does its, it, it does its job. You know, it, it, like you say, it creates, creates the elevation, which was sorely, mm -hmm. sorely missing for a long time. More importantly, it, it, create, it sets the scene for the base. It gives me the space for the, uh, for the aquarium back there, which is actually a relatively new addition or use of that space. And it, it feels good to me. You know, I, 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 like, I like seeing it there when I walk into the room. It gives me the opportunity to have the, the train tunnel there so you know trains going around the layout can disappear for a time around around the corner and also kind of helps to also establish a, a little bit of the the difference in terrain throughout the entire region here where the it's particularly flat in the city area or the industrial areas you know farther away from 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 uh, 
the more developed and flattened, you know, landfill kind of kind of spaces, a little bit more more naturally kind of feel a little bit of the geological history of the of the region. Yeah, that works very nice. And then we brings us to kind of the the larger cargo kind of bay area as well. And you've got trucks, you've got obviously ships, trains. It kind of brings all the transportation together in yeah. this section. <laughs> yeah, Lego, Lego's done a handful of really, really nice seaport kind of kind of sets. So definitely taken a lot of inspiration and a lot of parts from from some of those for, for the train support or the uh, the crane supports. But a lot of this also is is inspired by like I said, I, I grew up around boats and being around being around the water water's edge quite a lot. And uh, San Francisco region is a is a major international port mm -hmm. area. So we've we've got international airports, we've got international seaports as as well. And the, the Port of Oakland in particular, I think, gave me the most inspiration for, for what's here, including the big uh, container crane and just some of, the, some of the smaller scenes, the Port Authority building and just, yeah, the fact that the, the trains come, come right up to it. I, I, when I look at that space, I, I see an exact area over on the, on the Port of Oakland. <laughs> it's, it's not literally taken directly from there, but you know, the inspiration is from there. And a lot of people don't like big... Uh, specialized Lego mold pieces, molded pieces. I do though. I really like their their boat hulls. Yeah. I really, really, really. Oh, you know what? I lied. Earlier I said there's nothing on top of the table that is not custom, but this. Oh, throwback there. Mm -hmm. The the set was called Freighter. I don't remember which year it was, but this was a set that I desperately, desperately wanted as a kid. And finally did eventually get, but it's, it's based on, I think this came out around 1989, 90. That sounds English. right. That's what I would have guessed. Uh, yeah. But it's based on those, those old modular hull pieces that go all the way back to the seventies. And one of the, one of the boats that I, I was really, really interested in from those old magazines was the fire boat from mid like 75 ish or so which used these exact same pieces but in in red and they had the keel mm -hmm. that you could get the ballast piece so that you could actually put them into the water and they would float and they would stay upright and everything and that inspiration has stuck with me to this very day that's why i've allowed that one to to stay here just i did eventually get that as as a kid um yeah, those weird weighted pieces on the bottom were interesting. I'm sure some people have run across this and it's like, could this be a Lego element? That is indeed a Lego element. Mm -hmm. Just like a super heavy kind of black piece. Yeah, it's just <laughs> just molded molded with a bunch of metal. Like literally, <laughs> is it steel or is it zinc? I think on the inside, I don't have to worry about rust because it's completely and completely mm -hmm. enclosed. But yeah, I like I like Lego's, Lego's uh, preformed hull pieces. So I made sure to, to use a bunch of different types and... I'll, I'll definitely be building more uh, on on different types of, of hulls in, in the future, uh, as well as doing custom ones. So this is the very largest hull that they've ever made, largest unitary hull that they've ever made that's compatible with just the regular minifig stuff. I think there's one weird thing they did for Scala, Scala or Belleville or something, one really, really huge, ridiculous tub of a thing. <laughs> But for for the uh, for the regular minifig stuff, this was the biggest. I think this is the s second largest that they they had done as of the time that I had built this. But then this guy over here is is actually done with a custom hull. Honestly, I did this one with a custom hull just because I was getting so much flack from viewers like, "Oh, you're using the hulls. You should build your own." I just kind of did it to show. Yeah, I can build my own. There, are you happy? <laughs> now I'm going to go back to using just the regular hulls that I like. I've got a whole big old tub of different ones from different eras. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll continue to take inspiration from, from those and figure out different things to make out of them. But this is probably the, this is one of the, the most complete areas of the, of the city. You know, you've seen, you've seen little, little areas that are complete within themselves. Kind of pockets but, of stuff. Yeah, yeah, pockets. But this is, this is what a harbor area would look like to me. Um, you know, as as I would do it in its in its entirety. So it kind of shows the the level of detail, the level of of completeness, and all surfaces being considered, tiled or or studded. You know, just everything being how I would want it to be. The the crane actually is 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 workable. The train lines are accessible from from the main line. Um, 
yeah, everything is, is just so. And I love the variety you have over here as well with these different types of ships. And even, is this piece here, is that from like one of the old Mars themes? Or I'm trying yes, to think what, uh, that color life, is very unique. Life on Mars. That's life what, Mars. okay. For the, the, yeah, it was one of the, the alien, I think they, was it their transport system used that? Wait, I'm trying to remember. Yeah, definitely, that's, so that's sand purple we call that. Not a very common color. At Not all. at all. Not at all. Yeah, I also got a, a bunch of flack about that. <laughs> it's an ugly color. Yes, it is. And look at it. It's like a really weird type of prefab, yeah. you know, uh, metal structure that's going to be used in some foundry somewhere, you know? Again, just, just doing, doing weird stuff because I can sometimes, you know, just like, what is this part? What am I going to use it for? Oh, I'm going to use it for cargo. <laughs> Yeah. That's that's what it's all about being a Lego fan. Just using weird parts, doing cool stuff cuz you can't. Why not? <laughs> yeah. It, it, there's a lot of different a lot of different ways to approach it. Like you you asked earlier about realistic versus versus not. There's not a right answer to that, mm -hmm. you know. There's a right answer for a given person sometimes, you know, if if they want to specialize, but yeah, there's definitely no right or wrong way to to do Lego. And I'm I'm happy to to kind of jump around between different different philosophies from being totally fanciful, you know, looking at sci-fi to making a lot of Neva. <laughs> <laughs> really runs the game. Yeah. Here. Yeah. Now, I know we saw one underwater area earlier, oh, but there's yeah. another fantastic one here. So I wanted to make sure we showed that. Thank you. Because, I mean, again, there's color. It's everything that we talked about. There's so much to see down there. You've got this unique element, series of, of elements there, kind of using the gear pieces using the as gears, well. Yeah, to represent a, a dead coral area. So sometimes uh, things happen that will that will cause a, a region of coral to, to die out or a region of, of underwater life to die out if there's a, a major... Uh, temporal uh, temp temperature <laughs> event, mm -hmm. sorry, um, and I just those pieces just looked kind of perfect, and it it it's kind of sad if you think about it, you know. But you know, cycle of life is is a thing, and it it's visually just really really interesting, I think, and, and different is something you don't see that frequently. And so I just decided to, to simulate that in there, and then you know you transition back off to some areas that are relatively full of life and you know flourishing normally. And again, because this is below the table, so I allow myself to keep in some stuff that's not custom. Eventually, I think I'll swap out a lot of that stuff, do some custom uh, underwater research space and underwater long-term living experiment areas with the big, <laughs> big bubble domes that we have now available. But yeah, a lot of the, the Lego yellow submarines just look great. Yeah. Throughout so many eras too, you know, going back into the, I think, Late 80s, early 90s, I think, is when, when they first started doing some of the semi-realistic ones. Also, one of the first sets that I got as, a, as an adult, my first time getting back into Lego, was a, was a diver's set from the diver's line from around 19... Uh, it was 90s, I think, late, mid to late, mid to late 90s. And they had that, that semi-realistic style for, for underwater stuff, but just combining things from, from different eras and then just filling in a lot of, of different, what I consider to be foliage, but it's actually, you know, animal, animal life mm -hmm. that looks kind of plant-like in, in many cases, and as many colors as possible. Some of the, some of the coral is actually built uh, uh, in, a, in a separate space rather than building it here. I just created clumps, just like you do for, for seeding saltwater, you know, real saltwater aquariums. You have coral, you buy, buy the clump, and I just built clumps and then kind of started putting little inter, interim pieces in between to smooth it in. It's, it's a little bit of a mess, but I think, it's a, I think it's a nice, colorful, fun, happy to look at mess. <laughs> anyway. I mean, at the end of the day, can you ask for any more than that? <laughs> fair, fair. We're our, our own worst critics always. <laughs> No, I think I think it's fantastic. I think it adds uh, a great kind of you know layered element to it as well, especially because you have the water portions, so it really brings you know viewers into you know a whole other world under the water there. So I think it's a great addition to it, and it uh, looks looks fantastic. And it's Thanks. been so cool to see kind of the continual changes. I know we've touched on that a number of times in the yeah. video here as so we've made our way around. Is this is yeah. always a work in progress? Mm -hmm. So uh, what what are your plans for the future then, in terms of is 
is Jane Brick City kind of continuing well into the future? And is it going to be continued to adapt? Or is there any kind of end for you? Or is this always changing? I don't have an, I don't have an end goal in mind. I definitely, if I look at any particular area at any given time, like forget about the, the big changes that have happened mm -hmm. all the time, but at any given moment, if I look at an area, I know generally what's going to be there. I kind of have an idea of, of the end game, but for the, for the whole thing, I don't because it's, there's still so much to do that it doesn't even seem sensible for me to try to, to create a picture, a mental picture of, of finished, you know, eventually I'll get there. Um, but I, I have so many projects to, to fill in the spaces. A lot of open base plates around here need, need love. And <laughs> until, until every space is done to the level of detail that you see for some of the, the shoreline areas and for the cargo Harbor that we're looking at until everything is that good, I'm just going to keep at it, you know, and keep allowing inspiration to hopefully continue to flow mostly naturally. You know, I don't want to, I don't, I definitely don't want to force any of that creative stuff. Um, yeah, just as, as things come up that I want to focus on, get that one done. If I get stuck, you know, get creative block, switch over to a completely different project or make another car or something, you know, <laughs> cleanse the palette a little bit. There's nothing that can't be solved in life by building a Lego car. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> And of course, more trains, more trains. Oh yes, trains. yes. So when you when you have a big a big project to solve, you build a train. <laughs> so for people who are seeing this video, maybe this is kind of their their first introduction into oh. to you as a builder and your content. Oh. Um, talk about kind of your approach to creating content with the city. If people want to follow updates, uh, where where do you post those, and and how do you try to do that? Much much of the history of the development of the city here and also in the, the previous house, the original. This is New Jang City, it was the old Jang City as well. Uh, happened on my Jang Bricks channel on, on YouTube, the, the, main, the main big one. But as things have changed with the, with the platform, I've had to adapt and, and split out my content a little bit. But I actually have a, a city-specific channel now. As of the time of the recording of this video right here, right now, I've not been updating that much recently because I've had well, other things going on and also made some major, major changes. But mm -hmm. as of now, uh, I'm back in a comfortable space and that's, that's the place to go for all the updates, anything custom related. Uh, so individual mocks as I complete a, a specific mock, if it's a, a building or it's a vehicle or something that I can put into the studio, then I'll just, you know, take it all apart, show everybody all the interior details and everything as a, as a standalone video. And then just general updates you'll find just over time as they, you know, as stuff gets not necessarily done, but just progressed to where I want to talk about. Here's, here's what happened most recently. It's all in one place now. Yeah, sure. That works great. We'll make sure to put a link in the description of this video to, to that channel so that people can go check that out and hopefully continue to follow for, for more updates into the future. But another thing I wanted to touch on that you referenced earlier is building live on stream. And something that you've done a lot more recent years is yeah. Twitch live streaming where you do, uh, you know, maybe it's Gundam, it, may, it might be Lego, whatever it <laughs> mm -hmm. might be. So what are some, some of the types of content that you do on there and how do you kind of try to interact with your audience on Twitch versus maybe some of the YouTube stuff you've more traditionally done? Yeah, so I, I started out streaming a couple years ago on YouTube and I still go back to, to do some on YouTube as well, but I focus more on, on Twitch. Um, it's, I just have a, I, I went with the generalized name, The Jang, as the, <laughs> as, the, as the channel name, so it wouldn't be too specific to just Lego because I do, other things, like you said, with, with Gundam plastic model building a little bit, but it still focuses mostly on, on, on Lego. And I do most of my, uh, my set builds on, on, Le on, on the Twitch channel now live and also the custom stuff. I've, I've gotten to the point where I'm able to be comfortable doing creative work in front of an audience um, and not only sitting down in a, in a separate streaming space, but also in the city here. So. Some of the bigger projects that you've seen, like the, the zoo that I've worked on relatively recently, that whole big terrain feature uh, that opened up with the, the train loops going through it, that was all done live uh, on, on Twitch. I've got a rig that I've set up that's like a, a, vertical, a vertical cart uh, with a computer on and a couple of monitors, and I've got a <laughs> little uh, uh, mouse with a bunch of buttons so I can switch scenes, and four, four to five cameras are available. <laughs> I even have a camera that I can put, can put on the trains now that the train loops are hooked up again, where you can put a camera on there and in, in real time, live, anywhere in the world, you can actually see the perspective. I love going it. Around, <laughs> going around a, a, a train loop. 
And I do, I do stream a lot these days. It's like over 100 hours, 120 hours a month. Uh, uh, and uh, we have a really, really uh, fun community over there. I've brought a lot of folks over from, from the YouTube side and really tried to, to grow that space. Because, you know, what do you think of when you think of Twitch? You think of gaming, yeah. right? It, <laughs> but there's... It's it's a, fundamentally it's just a live streaming platform, and thank goodness there's a there's a making and crafting community there. There's an art community, there are an increasing number of of Lego builders over there. I know that Beyond the Brick has has some representation mm -hmm. starting to show up on on Twitch, which is great great to see. And and the folks there tend to skew a little bit older, I'd say, than on on YouTube, a little bit more mature on average, mostly upper teens and mostly adults. And just a really, really warm, supportive community. It's not, it's not, uh, it's not competitive. You know, Twitch has great features for sharing communities and and building community where you can take. And when you're done with the stream, you take all of your viewers and just send them to somebody else with what's called rating. And you see a lot of that happening in the the making and crafting spaces where people will share their communities and open up people's minds to other types of crafts and and you know similar vibes of, of spaces that they might not have seen. And it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a really, really positive space right now. That is super cool to hear. And I love to see the Lego community, yeah, doing more on Twitch and kind of moving into a different type of space like that. And I think there's a lot of possibilities and obviously you've made really good use of it as well. So uh, once again, everyone watching, make sure you go check out the live streams on Twitch as well, where you can get a, a variety of content like you were saying. And so there's kind of some, some of everything over there and there's always, some great community to be had as well. Do, do be warned though, I brought a level of interactivity that folks on YouTube might not be ready for. There's a whole <laughs> lot of stuff that chat can do. There's a whole lot of power that oh. chat has. <laughs> Things that they can make happen, sounds, video pop-ups. They'll see, they might even see, I don't know, maybe Mike from Beyond the Bricks might even show up in some oh. of the redeems on my channel. You'll, you'll be introduced to a whole lot of <laughs> memes and silliness and fun. <laughs> this is the prepared. 4D DJing experience. Yes, right? yes like, definitely. <laughs> Forget the what's, ASMR jang. Yes, yes. What's really the, the true madness deep inside comes out on Twitch. I love it. <laughs> That's so good. That's so cool. Uh, one thing I also wanted to ask you about was, you know, you've done this for a lot of years now, and yeah. there's so many people who associate you with kind of the, the Lego city layout and yeah. how you've done that over the years. Yeah. Uh, but in recent years, we've seen a lot of other people tackle the idea of like a Lego city, especially in their, in their house somewhere and kind yeah. of uh, laying that all out. Do you follow any other kind of creators that do that type of work? Have you kind of seen some of those pop up over the years? And what are your thoughts on kind of the, the, the rise in the, the Lego city building genre, especially among kind of content creators? Well, first of all, Lego city building is, has, you know, goes back before the internet. Like people, people have been building, you know, from, from kids to including even adults, you'll find like old Polaroid pictures will pop up every once in a while that show, you know, here's this person's Lego city in 1985. What? <laughs> and it's huge, you know, back when we had no bricklink or something. So yeah. it's, it's definitely not it's definitely not new. It's just a lot more visible now and I think especially since uh, since the Lego movie happened, the original Lego movie, it really helped a lot of adults to come out of their shell and and to be willing to share with the world like, yes, I am an adult and I'm a fan of Lego. And that's okay, you know. Mm -hmm. And here's what I do. So it's it, it's it's definitely blossomed a lot over the years, uh, which is fantastic to see because it's such a positive and fundamentally, literally and figuratively constructive hobby, you know. Uh, I personally, for a couple of reasons, have have not uh, spent a lot of time looking at other people's developments of the city. I'm I'm aware of of a bunch of them, but for a couple of reasons. Number one, I don't have a lot of time to to, <laughs> to look at other content because I I. I put my all into into what I do. You know, I I, I sleep way too little. That's why these these are here. I earned these. <laughs> but yeah, I I, I, do, I actually don't have a whole lot of time for even just regular recreation. I'm watching uh, movies and things, I tend to be behind. But also, more importantly for me, I don't want to accidentally take inspiration from other people's custom work. I can take inspiration from Lego itself. You know, stuff that they do, and from real life. It's kind of at a bigger level. But I think that. When people do custom stuff, it's it's personal, and I want I, I really like to respect that, 
and and not you know you look at something if you really really like it and you're also doing something similar you're likely to do something somewhat similar and, and it might not be on purpose you know it's not all about copycatting but we we naturally take inspiration from one another and i really want to make this a very personal thing uh the the custom stuff that i do in this this city i want it to be from from my experience i want it to be as much as possible not regurgitating anything that i've that i've captured from other fellow hobbyists but rather just from my own my own life experiences and and also just the madness of my brain and, 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 and the, you know, the, the wonder and, 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 and fancy of, of the child that's still inside of me as, as well. So. You, t you touched on an interesting point that I wanted to ask you about there as well with kind of the broader idea of content creation and the balance of that. You mm -hmm. mentioned, you know, kind of pouring yourself into yeah. so much of your content. And yeah. you do a ton. I mean, obviously, we've seen the city, which you make updates on as well, in addition to just building. You do your set reviews, mm -hmm. which are continually, obviously, coming out. Um, you do all the, the Twitch streaming, which yeah. is a tremendous amount of time. Yeah. So how do you kind of find that balance there? Is that a difficult thing for you to kind of hold yourself back and say, hey, you know, maybe hmm. there's just too much going on or hmm. uh, you've got to find that balance. How, how does that work for you as a creator? Because I know that's something that a lot of creators going to talk about and think about. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 burnout is a real thing. Um, I have experienced it in the past. I have dedicated myself to not experiencing burnout in the Lego hobby in particular because I really, really like it. And I want to, I want to make sure that I have a genuinely positive outlook on this hobby at all times. Anytime that I'm creating content, if, if I look like I'm enjoying it, it's because I actually am. You know, I, don't, I don't ever want to have to get to the point where I have to act that I'm, that I'm liking, liking mm -hmm. this stuff. And in order, in order to preserve that, I have to... I have to be mentally good, I have to be physically good, I have to take care of myself. So I definitely, and with the help of friends and family, you know, who, who support me, who support what I do, but want me to be healthy, you know, again, mentally and physically, I make sure that I, I keep track of how far I'm extending myself. In the most, in the last few years, I've definitely extended myself more than more than is normal and more than I really should because you know there was so much tumult that happened with the the COPPA thing and and algorithm changes you know I lost a whole lot you know after building up for almost 10 years I lost the vast majority of that and I've I've not wanted to give up on any of it I've mm -hmm. wanted to come back as strong as possible and find ways to, to overcome you know things that have hit me that are outside of my control and I've been pretty successful at that, at, at you know, clawing my way back into a space where, where I feel like you know, the, the channels are working and I'm able to, to get access to, to the people who actually, or, or I'm able to connect with the people who actually want to see, see my content. But to, to get to that point, this, this grind that I've been doing uh, with all those hours of Twitch streaming and all the reviewing and still doing all of this is definitely more than I would recommend for, uh, for anybody but you know it, it depends it depends on it depends on what is comfortable for a given individual um, I'm I'm naturally a workaholic um, not ev not everybody is that's not a good thing you know because work work-life balance is very very important of course you know family and, and friends and real life is is more important than any of this but thankfully for me I'm, I'm fortunate to have supportive family um, and to have to have the time and, and the the natural um, uh, impetus to to put in the extra necessary and the idea is to eventually get to a point within the next couple of years where I'm comfortable again, able to kind of cool it just a little bit, relax a little bit more, maybe go out there and, and be more of a viewer and you know not just a content creator and and yeah find a little bit better balance definitely where I am right now, just to be perfectly honest, is, is not balanced as, as, as it should be. But I'm, I've, I'm conscious of that and working towards fixing it. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I'm happy to hear that. And I know speaking for myself and I think many of the viewers out there, we want to see you, you know, be successful for many years in the future. So thank you for all the work you put in. And I'm glad you're keeping those things in mind and we'll continue to hopefully see you creating 
all of this different content for, for many years to come. So this is so fantastic. Thank you for the, the look through the whole city and just so much of your insight into you know, your builds and everything you've done here over the years and for, for having us back once again, I appreciate thank it. Thank you for being here and thank you for all the things that you guys do as well. I mean, you, you, you go out there, you do the work, <laughs> you travel the country and the world and give people, so many people around the world, the ability to like visit a con when they're not able to. You know, that's that, the work that you do. I hope that, that you guys Every once in a while, just are able to, to take a step back and be like, okay, we did all right. You oh, know? yeah. Oh, it's, yeah. It's, I try to. Sometimes at conventions, I'll just try to sit there and kind of like soak, soak it all in okay. and be like, this is, uh, this is really amazing yeah. that, that we're able to come in and just share our time with yeah. so many incredibly talented people and just yeah. really appreciate yeah. you know, everything that we've been able to do and what all the builders do in the community. Yeah. So thank you for that. Yeah, we certainly have tried our best. <laughs> Well done, well done. Thank you. Thanks everyone for, for watching as well. Like I mentioned, we'll have the uh, links to Jane's various channels in the description of this video. So if you have not followed him in the past, you should get on that right away. Check all of that content out and his amazing backlog of many years of videos as well if you're just being introduced to his content. So check all of that out and have fun building. Thank you.